Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am a senior Washington correspondent for the Detroit News and president of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of future speakers. On Friday, April 27th, Angela Perez Baracchio, Miss America, will be our guest. On Wednesday, May 2nd, Donna Brazil, former campaign manager for Al Gore, will be here to discuss election reform. How do we make it better next time? And on Thursday, March 3rd, uh, World Press Freedom Day, Vladimir Gazinsky, head of NTV in Russia, will be here to, at the press club to talk about press freedom in Russia. And on Friday, May 4th, Richard Moe, President of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, will be our guest. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your tables and pass them up to me. But please write legibly so I can read the questions. And I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced and, and uh, uh, have been able to stand up. From your right and my left, we have Larry Arnold, Washington reporter for the Associated Press. Gene Grabowski, a former Associated Press on Capitol Hill who covered our speaker and also a member of our speakers committee. Aaron Epstein, reti <coughs> retired from Knight Ritter newspapers and now a writing coach for the journal newspapers. Arthur Bernstein, president of the United Sports Fans of America and a member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Larry Speaks, a former press secretary for President Reagan. Gilbert Grobner, chairman of the board, National Geographic. Senator Jim Bunning, Republican from Kentucky and a pitcher for the Detroit Tigers and Philadelphia Phillies, who is now a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Frank Ockerfer, the National Press Club Speakers Committee chairman and a former NPC president. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, David Hess, the National Journal and a former National Press Club president and the Speakers Committee member who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, David. Angela Greiling of Small Newspapers. Greg Gilbert, Bureau Chief, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Larry Margasak, Investigative Reporter, Associated Press. George Condon, Bureau Chief, Copley Newspapers. Tom Deemer, Reporter, Cleveland Plain Dealer. And Al Isley, editor of The Hill and a pitcher in the Cleveland Indians farm system for three and a half years. Thank you. <laughs> Introducing our guest speaker today, Dale Petrosky, president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, is truly a pleasant assignment for me. Not only do I get to introduce someone who has arguably the best job in America, but I get to introduce a very good friend. Dale and I have been friends since he arrived in Washington 20 years ago as the press secretary for a congressman from Western Michigan. While that congressman quickly departed the political scene, Dale went on to become an assistant White House press secretary in the Reagan administration and chief spokesman for Elizabeth Dole when she was secretary of transportation. He then spent 11 years as a top executive with the National Geographic Society in Washington. But his true passion has always been baseball. When he was named Hall of Fame president in June of 1999, Dale said, and I quote, I was born with baseball in my blood. My dad made sure of that. My passion for the game is at the very core of who I am. As a kid growing up in the suburbs of Detroit, Dale dreamed of playing second base for his beloved Detroit Tigers. His romance for the game was so passionate that when he was confirmed in the Catholic Church, he chose St. Rocco as his patron saint. <laughs> And if you need to ask, Rocco was the name of Dale's all-time baseball hero, Rocky Colavito. 
a home run hitting outfielder for the Detroit Tigers and Cleveland Indians. Dale ushered at Tiger Stadium, wiping off seats for paying patrons just so he could watch his heroes take batting and fielding practice. As a teenager, he played on two national championship teams and went on to play two years with the Central Michigan University Chippewas. But his dream of a pro career ended when he discovered, like so many others, that sharp breaking curveballs are not so easy to hit. <laughs> <laughs> he transferred to Michigan State University, where he graduated in 1978 with a degree in journalism. But when he came to Washington, Dale's love for the game and the Detroit Tigers never dwindled. Dale and his brother Dennis and a friend, Bill McKay, founded the Mayo Smith Society in 1983. The society was named after former Detroit Tigers manager Mayo Smith, who managed the Tigers to their 1986 World Series victory. Oh, I'm sorry, 1968 World Series victory over the St. Louis Cardinals. Today, the society has more than 2,000 members. Dale, 45, now lives with his wife and three children in Cooperstown, New York, a, a town of 2,300 residents and, I believe, the greatest shrine in sports. But I have to tell you, that as a Hall of Fame president, Dale's loyalty to the Detroit Tigers has become suspect. <laughs> Last year, I was at a luncheon when Mike Waller, who is the publisher of the Baltimore Sun, calmly declared that Eddie Collins, the old second baseman for the Philadelphia Athletics and Chicago White Sox, was unquestionably the best second baseman ever to play baseball. I disagreed. Anyone who has ever grown up in Detroit knows, without doubt, that Charlie Gehringer was the best second baseman ever. There's no doubt about that. Mike Wall and I talked about it. We sort of disagreed. But like so many baseball arguments, it was never settled. But I decided to call Dale, my old friend from Detroit, a down-to-the-soul, or so I thought, Detroit Tigers fan. He would take up Charlie's cause. I knew Mike Wall would respect a letter from the president of the Hall of Fame. <laughs> but, but when I asked Dale to write that letter, declaring Charlie the best, there was a long pause. <laughs> you know, Dick, he said, as president of the Hall of Fame, I have to remain neutral. I can't take sides. Well, I understand that, I told Dale, but, but we're talking about sweet-fielding Charlie Gehringer here. <laughs> this is the man who had 300 or better 13 times in his career. This is the Detroit Tigers. There was another long pause. Well, Dick, Dale said, Eddie Collins was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the letter was never written. So I've asked Dale to come to the National Press Club today to settle this argument. <laughs> Who was better, Eddie Collins or Charlie Gehringer? Please join me in welcoming Dale Petrosky, president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, the National Press Club. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Geringer was pretty good. Collins was pretty good. All the other second basemen in the Hall of Fame are pretty good. Joe Morgan, Nap Lajouet, Rogers Hornsby. So um, everybody who makes it's pretty good. <laughs> Sorry I couldn't help you out, though. Had something going. It is humbling to be here and a real honor for everyone connected with the Baseball Hall of Fame. So thank you for the invitation. I'd like to say something about my two special head table guests, Gil Grosvenor the chairman of the board of National Geographic, and Larry Speaks, who for six years was President Reagan's press secretary. They were great bosses to me and great mentors, and I'll never, ever be able to thank them enough for all they did for me. Um, Senator Bunning, the only person elected to two exclusive clubs, the United States Senate and the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I'd like to remind the senator that the Hall of Fame is more exclusive because there are only 61 living Hall of Famers. <laughs> And you don't have to run for re-election. <laughs> it's a lifetime appointment, Senator. <laughs> it's fun to be back in Washington, where Ann and I spent 18 years before heading up to Cooperstown a few years ago. And I was here in January for the alfalfa dinner, and I was standing at the cocktail reception with Joe Morgan, the great second baseman, now a TV broadcaster. And Joe spotted Henry Kissinger across the room. And he said, I've always wanted to meet Henry Kissinger. So I said, well, we'll go over and see him. Well, Joe got pulled away, and I was distracted for a few minutes. And about 20 minutes later, Joe came up, and he said, you're not going to believe what happened. Big smile on his face. He said, Henry Kissinger walked across the room, extended his hand, and said, 
Joe Morgan, I've always wanted to meet you. <laughs> there's always been a great connection between Washington and baseball, and I think there's a great fascination one for the other. The Hall of Fame in Washington have crossed paths a couple times in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you may have seen that President Bush invited all the living Hall of Famers to the, Hall of Fame, or to the White House um, a couple weeks ago to kick off the season on March 30th. And 46 of the 61 living Hall of Famers made the trip to Washington. And it is a day none of us will ever forget. A beautiful ceremony in the East Room, lunch in the State Dining Room, um, just great hospitality by the President and uh, Mrs. Bush. And I think they had a pretty good time, too. And then two weeks ago, uh, the FBI returned four baseballs signed by U.S. presidents to us, uh, Taft, Wilson, Coolidge, and Hoover. Those balls were donated to the Hall of Fame by the Walter Johnson family in 1968, and in 1972 they were stolen from the Hall of Fame. But thanks to the good work of the FBI, our collection is complete again, and we have a signature on a baseball from every president, from William Howard Taft to George W. Bush now. And uh, a few of them will be part of a White House exhibit that the Hall of Fame is doing in the east wing of the White House. And it will be up and running in time for the beginning of the new T-ball season that the President announced a few weeks ago. And so that will be um, in uh, time for the May 6th opening of that. And the subject of that exhibit will be baseball and the presidency. Today I'd like to talk about three things. First of all, what the Hall of Fame really is. Uh, then I'd like to tell some, some of the great untold stories that we uncover every day in Cooperstown. And then I'd like to tell you where we're headed. Where's the future of the Hall of Fame? Let's start by talking about uh, Cooperstown, though. It's a very special place. How many of you have been to Cooperstown? Fair number. Okay. Well, you know then that it's a village of 2,300, uh, 70 miles west of Albany. It sits between the Adirondacks and the Catskills. Uh, on beautiful Otsego Lake, which was made famous by James Fenimore Cooper in his Leather Stocking Tales. We have three world-class museums, the James Fenimore Cooper Museum of Art, the Farmer's Museum, which is a living farm and village depicting life in the 1850s in rural upstate New York, and the Baseball Hall of Fame. We have an elegant summer hotel, the Otisaga. We have a championship golf course that goes with it, uh, the Glimmer Glass Opera, and a fine hospital, the Bassett Hospital, which is affiliated with Columbia University. And the Hall of Fame sits right on Main Street. What exactly is the Hall of Fame? It's more than a building. To me, it's the family that spends um, its, its vacation money that's been saving for a couple of years, drives cross country, pulls up in front of the Hall of Fame, gets out of the car, and the first thing they do is line up in front of the sign and get their picture taken just to prove to themselves that they actually made it to Cooperstown. We see that day after day after day in Cooperstown. We're also a nonprofit educational institution founded in 1936, and our doors opened in 1939. We have 90 full-time employees, a $12 million annual budget, and we exist really for three reasons. To preserve history, to honor excellence, and to connect generations. In our collections, we have 30,000 artifacts, 135,000 baseball cards, many of them probably the ones your mother threw out. Uh, we have 500,000 historic photographs, 5,000 hours of original TV and radio recordings, and 2 million documents in our library. And our research staff answers 60,000 questions a year, many like the ones that Dick was uh, <laughs> referring to. We do not pay for any artifacts or documents. Everything we have has been donated to us. And if you do donate something and we accept it, you get a lifetime pass to the Hall of Fame. We are baseball's institution of record, and we document the game from the Little League to the Major Leagues. And we have a file on every player who's ever played in the Major Leagues, all 15,400 of them. Now, many people who have never been to Cooperstown think we're just a small gallery of plaques. But our plaque gallery is only 5,000 square feet of our 60,000 square foot museum. It is the focal point, though. And it's where we honor the game's greatest players, managers, umpires, and executives. Only 185 players in the history of the game are enshrined in Cooperstown. Four more will go in this year. Dave Winfield, Kirby Puckett, Bill Mazeroski, and Hilton Smith, the great Negro Leagues pitcher, and they'll be inducted on August the 5th in Cooperstown. Of all the players 
privileged to play Major League Baseball, 1% make it to Cooperstown. One out of 100. So if there are 750 players in the Major Leagues today, who are the seven or eight that are going to make it to Cooperstown someday? By honoring excellence, we like to think we help inspire excellence. Now, baseball is a game that is easily passed down from generation to generation. And because we're a game that tells the history of the game, the Hall of Fame is a place where families come together and get even closer. And when you walk through the museum and you see a father talking to his kids in an animated way about his heroes of his youth, all of a sudden that 50-year-old becomes a 10-year-old boy again. Or we see a grandmother talking to her grandchildren about listening to a game on the radio in the 1940s. It just, uh, it just warms your heart. There are so few opportunities for the generations to be connected. The Baseball Hall of Fame is one such place, and we're very proud of that. We also have an education program. Uh, certified teachers teach geography, history, art, economics, communications to elementary and middle school kids. And um, all of our program is certified with the New York State standards. And we have a Frank and Peggy Steele internship program. We invite the best and brightest students from the country to come to Cooperstown and work with us and learn curatorial skills and library skills and communication skills. When you think about it, though, what would baseball be without the Hall of Fame? There'd be no shrine to baseball heroes, nothing to aspire to. Every day you hear talk about a Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer, potential Hall of Famer. It is the ultimate dream of every major leaguer, and it's the source of endless speculation and debate for every fan. If there were no Hall of Fame, we wouldn't have a Pete Rose controversy. I'd be a lot happier. <laughs> I'm always impressed that everywhere I go, people care so passionately about who's in the Hall of Fame or who should be in the Hall of Fame. It shows me that it's important, and it shows me how special people feel about the Hall of Fame. I also pick up some misconceptions about us. Uh, many people think we're tied to Major League Baseball. We're not. We're an independent institution uh, dedicated to preserving baseball history and telling its story in a historically accurate way. We enjoy a very good relationship with baseball, Major League Baseball, and they've been great friends through the years and tremendously cooperative with us. But our independence is important. It's important for the game, and it's important for the fans. Many people think that Pete Rose and Shoeless Joe Jackson are nowhere to be found in the Hall of Fame. We treat them as if they never existed. Couldn't be further from the truth. Their artifacts and their exhibits are everywhere in the Hall of Fame. You can't tell baseball's story without telling the story of Pete Rose and Shoeless Joe Jackson. My first week on the job a few years ago, Don Sutton, the Hall of Fame pitcher, said to me, you know, they've just handed you the keys to the Vatican. <laughs> now, baseball's always been sort of a religion to me, and you can see from what Dick said that I've mixed baseball and religion from time to time. <laughs> and I am Catholic, so I understood exactly what Sutton was saying. <laughs> Cooperstown really is the spiritual home of baseball. And I'd like to just tell a few of the thousands of stories that we uncover every day there to show you how people feel about this game. One of the most important and least understood aspects of the history of the game is the Negro Leagues, which were professionally organized from 1920 to 1960. And many of those stories are the stuff of legend. For example, in 1930, a Pittsburgh newspaper ran a story about a 44-year-old pitcher for the Homestead Grays, the local team, who had struck out 27 Kansas City Monarchs in a 12-inning game. His name was Joe Williams, Smokey Joe Williams. And what the newspaper account didn't say was this was a night game. And the Monarchs had a portable lighting system, which wasn't very good. So the lights were dim. The other pitchers struck out 19 hitters. So between them, there were 46 strikeouts in a 12-inning game. Now, Joe Williams was by everybody's account, a fantastic pitcher, and he was elected to the Hall of Fame two years ago. He dominated the Negro Leagues, and he pitched against major leaguers, Grover Cleveland Alexander, Walter Johnson, some of the great pitchers of his time, and he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and gave as good as he got. But what's instructive about this story is that there was no mention in that newspaper account that this was a night game five years before the first night game in Major League history was played in Cincinnati. 
For economic reasons, the media coverage of the Negro Leagues was spotty at best. So the question is, how many feats were accomplished in the Negro Leagues that we don't know about? And how many of the facts and records that were accomplished are published absent the context without the circumstances surrounding those records? We're attempting to do something about this. We've commissioned an academic team led by a PhD in history, Dr. Larry Hogan of Union College in New Jersey, to do our first ever academic study. It's being funded with a generous grant from Major League Baseball, and we hope to have some results in two years. The subject of the study is broad, African-American baseball from 1860 to 1960, and our goal is to uncover new information never before brought to light so we understand the Negro Leagues better than we ever have before. But we don't need a study to understand that many Negro Leagues players could play on anybody's team in any era. Smokey Joe Williams, Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, Cool Papa Bell. But none were in the Hall of Fame when Ted Williams stepped to the microphone in 1966 for his induction speech. Here's what he said. Inside this building are plaques dedicated to baseball men of all generations and I'm privileged to join them. Baseball gives every American boy a chance to excel, not just to be as good as someone else, but to be better than someone else. This is the nature of man and the name of the game. And I've always been a lucky guy to have worn a baseball uniform, to have struck out, or to have hit tape measure home runs. And I hope that someday the names of Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson in some way can be added as a symbol of the great Negro players that are not here only because they were not given a chance. Five years later, Satchel Paige was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And when Hilton Smith is inducted this year, he becomes the 18th player in the Hall of Fame. Now, Ted Williams is a hero to many with a bat in his hand, as a fighter pilot, with a fishing rod in his hand. But few people realize that he was responsible for helping to open the Hall of Fame's doors to the greatest Negro Leagues players. And it took 20 years after Satchel Paige was inducted for Major League Baseball to show a long overdue sensitivity to the situation. It happened in 1991 during a three-day reunion of the players and their families in Cooperstown. And it was Faye Vincent, the commissioner at the time, who said, with sorrow and regret, I apologize for the injustice you've been subjected to. When one thinks of the Negro Leagues, one automatically thinks of that seminal moment in 1947 when Jack Robinson, he preferred to be called Jack, not Jackie, stepped onto the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The game was changed forever, overnight. But not just for African Americans. It's too simple to think of that as a black-white issue. If you were a Latino player and your skin was light enough, you could play in the major leagues before 1947. Bobby Estelea, who played here in Washington from the mid-30s to the mid-40s, is an example of that. But dark-skinned Latinos were banned from baseball. Louis Tiant Sr. was an outfielder from Cuba. He couldn't play in the major leagues. His son went on to a pretty fair career as a pitcher years later. Perucho Cepeda, one of the greatest players in Puerto Rican history, couldn't play in the major leagues. But his son Orlando had a Hall of Fame career. When Jack Robinson broke down the color barrier, he did so not just for African Americans, but for dark-skinned Latinos as well. And the first Latino to benefit from Robinson's courage was Cuban-born Minnie Minoso, who in 1949 was allowed to move from the Negro Leagues to the Major Leagues, where he spent 17 seasons. When players of color were allowed into the Major Leagues, they didn't just assimilate they dominated. The teams with the better players became immediately successful. The Dodgers, the Giants, the Milwaukee Braves. From 1947, the year of integration, to 1959, the year the, the Red Sox finally integrated, players of color were rookies of the year in 1947, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 56, 58, and 59. In those same 13 seasons, Most Valuable Player Awards were won by players of color in 1949, 51, 
53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, and 59. In addition to Jack Robinson, the names were Mays, Black, Newcomb, Frank Robinson, Cepeda, McCovey, Campanella, Aaron, Banks. Jack Robinson's epitaph has been reduced to a few words. He broke the color barrier. Sadly, this shorthanded history undervalues him as a player. If someone else had led the way and Robinson had come along 10 years later, he would be known as a much greater player than he's known today and one of the greatest American athletes ever. Consider this. In football in 1939 at UCLA, he led the nation in rushing with an 11.4 yards per carry average. He also set the NCAA record for punt returns with a 21-yard average. In basketball, he led the Pacific Coast Conference in scoring two seasons in a row. In track, he was the world's greatest broad jumper in 1939 and 40 and was expected to win the Olympic gold medal. The Olympics were canceled because of World War II. In the major leagues, he averaged 311 during his career, six all-star games, led the Dodgers to six pennants, but it was his base running that electrified the crowds, helped the Dodgers win and changed the game forever. Fans have always loved the home run, the big hit, and there's always been a following of the home run races. In 1998, it seemed like everybody in America was following McGuire and Sosa as they were chasing the Maris record. And the Maris Mantle race is getting a lot of attention this week as Billy Crystal's movie is about to premiere on HBO on Saturday night. Everyone knows Maris hit 61 home runs in 1961 to break Ruth's record of 60. But who was the single season home run champion before Ruth? His name was Ned Williamson. Anybody here ever hear of Ned Williamson? He held the record for 35 years. And here's how it happened. He played for Chicago in the National League and they played in Little Lakefront Park. And here were the dimensions, 192 down the right field line, <laughs> 252 in right center, 300 in left center, and 180 in left field. How would you like to pitch in that park, Senator? <laughs> <laughs> and here were the ground rules. Fly balls over the fence were counted as ground rule doubles, not home runs. Except in 1884, when fly balls over the fence were finally counted as home runs. And that year, the Chicago team set the Major League record for home runs. They hit 142, four times the Major League record before it and Williamson hit 27 of them. And that record stood for 35 years until young Babe Ruth came along and hit 29 for the Red Sox in 1919. You all know the story. He was traded to the Yankees in the offseason, went to New York, and by mid-July of his first season with the Yankees, he had already broken his own record. And he went on to 54 that season. Now, to show how dominant Ruth was as a home run hitter, he hit more home runs by himself than every team in the American League except Philadelphia that year. The next year he broke his own record again with 59 and a few years later he hit his 60. To show what a force he was compared to everybody else in the league, he hit 14 percent of all the home runs in the league when he hit 60. By contrast, when McGuire hit 70, that was less than 3 percent of all the home runs in the National League that year. Ruth brought a new era to baseball. He swung for the fences, Yankees started their winning tradition, and everybody loved both. But not everybody loved the home run, and not everybody thought it was good for the game. Ty Cobb, who was Ruth's competitive rival, they were very competitive with each other, believed in playing the game from base to base. He thought it made for a more interesting game, more strategy, uh, more skill, keep the ball in play, and he thought the home run hurt the game in some way. Now you might say that's sour grapes. Ruth could hit him and Cobb couldn't hit him, so he didn't like the home run. After all, Ruth had 700 plus career home runs. Cobb had about 100. But listen to this. In May 1925, Cobb was in St. Louis to play a game in Sportsman's Park and he was talking to the sports writers before the game and he said, they say I get my base hits on infield grounders and bunts. The big guy, you know, Babe Ruth, he socks those home runs. I'm going to show you something today. 
I'm going for home runs for the first time in my career. That day, Cobb hit three long home runs into the pavilion in right field in Sportsman's Park. The next day, he hit two more. Ty Cobb became the first player in Major League history to hit five home runs in two days. Now, you'd expect that from Ruth, not Cobb. Despite their rivalry, Ru Ruth called Cobb the greatest hitter he ever saw. There have been many great home run hitters. There are many great home run hitters today. But clearly, the greatest of all time is Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron averaged 33 home runs a year for 23 seasons. Averaged. When 33 home runs meant something. And I always liked the story by Joe Adcock, his old teammate. He used to say, trying to sneak a fastball by Hank Aaron is like trying to sneak the sunrise past a rooster. <laughs> Now, many people make the pilgrimage to Cooperstown for very personal reasons. And in 1994, the Hall of Fame was being renovated, and our World War II exhibit case was being taken down, and one of our staff found something wedged behind it. And so they gave it to our curator, Ted Spencer. And the picture was of a burly man in a Sinclair Oil baseball uniform, obviously a company team. Attached to the back was a note from his son. It read, you were never too tired to play catch. On your days off, you helped build the Little League field. You always came to watch me play. You were a Hall of Fame dad. I wish I could share this moment with you. Your son, Pat. And when things were put back in place, Ted put the photo back where it was found, along with instructions to all future curators that it remain there, assuring that Pat's dad will always be in the Hall of Fame as a tribute to all the parents who play catch with their children and teach them to love the game. Those are just a few of the stories that unfold every day in Cooperstown. And we're uncovering more every day. But what about the future? Where is the Hall of Fame headed? We have new leadership at the Hall. Jane Forbes Clark is our chairman. She's been in that position less than a year. And she is a dynamic leader and absolutely committed to excellence in everything that she does. Our vice chairman is Joe Morgan, and he's been in his position for less than a year. I've been in place less than two years. And Bill Hasse, who was in management with the Detroit Tigers for 18 years, nine as chief operating officer, is our newest vice president, and he's been in place since September. So we're all new. And while we stand on the shoulders of all who have come before us, we have big plans. We have never before traveled our treasures outside of Cooperstown. We've never taken a major exhibition out to America until now. For the past few years, we've been developing an exhibit titled Baseball as America, which will show how baseball has always reflected and sometimes even shaped American culture. It's a rich exhibi exhibition uh, filled with substance and nuance, and every major museum that we've uh, talked to about it has wanted it. It'll travel to the finest museums, in 10 American cities over three and a half years beginning next spring. And we'll be ready to talk about the details of it in the early summer. The tour will also be the first time we will ever allow a national sponsor to be aligned with us. And whichever company ultimately becomes our partner will be an appropriate natural fit, I can assure you of that, and help us to reach, reach out beyond our traditional audiences. A major book is being published along with the exhibition by National Geographic, and we're very proud to be working with the Geographic, and obviously that book will reach new audiences as well. Next, we'd like to use our website to help people outside of Cooperstown stay connected to us. In the past, the only way people felt connected was the day they visited us. Now with web technology, they can stay connected to us and baseball history every day of the year, and our Friends of the Hall of Fame membership program allows for that. We'd also like to take advantage of technology to make our curriculum and lesson plans available to every teacher in every school in the United States. We need to always be positioned to preserve and display our priceless collections with state-of-the-art technology. We need to support more studies to help us learn more about baseball and American history. The African-American study is just the first of many we ought to be doing. And because children are the future, we are looking to de develop some dynamic and far-reaching programs for children. In order to fulfill our mission today and do the things we need to do in the future, 
We will soon be announcing an endowment, the, the launch of an endowment campaign. And our goal is $50 million over five years. And if we're successful, there's no challenge we can't meet and there's no opportunity we can't pursue. America would not be America without baseball. The game is woven into the fabric of this country. And baseball is far more connected to its history and American history than any other sport by far. And we like to think that we've had a little something to do with that. As today's stewards of baseball's Hall of Fame, our responsibility is to treasure and share those memories with as many people as possible. And if we do our job well, the common heritage that we've always shared as Americans through baseball will not only endure, it will flourish. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you, you, you know this is going to come, so let's do it right up front. When, if there's a number of questions, when, if ever, will Pete Rose be inducted into the Hall of Fame? In your opinion, should Pete Rose be eligible for the Hall of Fame? And this one f comes from a Cincinnatian who says, how can you sleep at night knowing that baseball's all-time <laughs> hits leader is not in the Hall of Fame? And can you see a way at all for Pete Rose to clear his name enough to enter the Hall? Well, this is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's the most often asked question that we get. I think what's important to say is that people care enough about it and are passionate about it. Um, in August of 1999, Pete Rose voluntarily signed uh, a lifetime ban from baseball. And in 1991, the Hall of Fame's board adopted a rule, really formalized a rule that was unwritten before that, that players who were on the permanently ineligible list would not be considered for election to the Hall of Fame. Um, Pete Rose is a great ball player. I loved Pete Rose as a kid growing up. Um, but it is what it is. And, um, and uh, he is on the permanently ineligible list, and the Hall of Fame board formally said that they will not, al not uh, uh, allow consideration of somebody on that list. Was there more to it? I sleep pretty good at night, but <laughs> <laughs> well, this is. Let me ask the question here. We have to. We have to work this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, wants to know if there are any differences between the Pete Rose and Shoeless Joe Jackson situations. You know, my position really is that they're both on the permanently, permanently ineligible list, and so they're coupled that way, and uh, as such, they just won't be considered for the Hall of Fame at this time. Um, this one asked someone along the same line, but it says, judging by the mail you receive, who do fans think are the three greatest victims of exclusion from the Paul Hall of Fame? Three. three. <laughs> First of all, I think you need to understand I have no vote in who gets into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> the baseball writers, our electors, as well as the Veterans Committee. Um, to be honest, we hear about Gil Hodges. I mean, that's one that keeps coming up. Um, Gosh, uh, oh, you know, there are movements for Whitey Herzog. Um, you know, Ron Santo is one that will come up. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, I mean, everybody's got their favorite players. I have my favorite players. I don't express my opinion. But uh, I think that's, that we're passionate about it, and we have our favorite players, and we like to see them uh, given the recognition we think they deserve. But uh, I think those are three names that keep coming up. and. Uh, who knows? I mean, uh, forever's a long time. We'll see, uh, we'll see uh, what happens in the future. This questioner wants to know, it says that with talk that the San Diego Padres have paid up to $1 million, so Dave Winfield would have a, a Padres cap on his bust at the, at the Hall of Fame, and wants to know if you would consider uh, not allowing players to dictate the cap that they will wear in the Hall. I'm glad this question came up because it's really misunderstood. First of all, Dave Winfield says that he did not get a million dollars from the Padres. I just want to make, make that clear. Um, the cap issue keeps coming up, and it will come up more as more and more players play for various teams. Um, in the last couple of years, three people going into the Hall of Fame have had this issue come up. Sparky Anderson, 
Cincinnati or Detroit, Carlton Fisk, Boston or Chicago, and Dave Winfield, San Diego or New York. We work with them, uh, and our job is to do what is historically accurate. And Sparky picked Cincinnati, and Fisk picked Boston, and Winfield picked San Diego. And I think a point can be made that that's historically accurate. You could make the case that those were the right decisions for those players. Either way, they would have been the right decision. But Babe Ruth going in as a Boston Brave, where he played the last year of his career, or Hank Greenberg going in as a Pittsburgh Pirate would not be historically accurate. And we reserve the right in the end to do what is historically accurate for the Hall of Fame. So in the end, we have the final decision on which cap they're allowed to wear in the Hall of Fame. To this point, people have been very responsible about this. Uh, regarding your induction policy, this question asked if the uh, Hall of Fame intends to continue to induct individuals from the 19th century, turn of the, uh, the 19th century, the turn of the century, from the Negro Leagues, and do you think that any women candidates uh, will ever be considered or be inducted into the Hall? Um, right now, we do continue to elect 19th century candidates and Negro Leagues candidates. There are special ballots for each. On women, I, I don't know. I, don't, I can't look into the future. Um, you know, things are happening today that couldn't have been dreamed about 30 or 40 years ago. So, you never know. Well, because you are come out of politics uh, and you know you know a little bit about that issue, uh, does uh, what what political considerations are used when it comes to electing people for the Hall of Fame? Okay. I assume this has to do with the Veterans Committee um, versus the baseball writers. Um, I, I again. Be Dick, because people really care about their person wanting uh, getting into the Hall of Fame. You hear a lot of criticism from time to time. But I will tell you, there are 15 members of the Veterans Committee, five Hall of Famers, five members of the media, and five executives. These people are steeped in baseball history. They care about the Hall of Fame deeply. They care about who gets in. A lot of homework goes into looking at, at um, careers in the context of the times they played. And uh, I will say they do a pretty darn good job and try to leave politics out of it. Here are a few questions about potential uh, Hall of Famers. Um, this one notes that Billy Pierce, a former Detroit Tiger, uh, but mostly with the Chicago White Sox, should he be in the, the Hall of Fame? Uh, how do you rate Albert Bell's chances of getting into the Hall? And this one says something about, isn't Nellie Fox really the best second baseman that ever played? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got an opinion, don't they? <laughs> um, Albert Bell, that'll be up to the writers. They'll have a chance to uh, vote on him in five years. And, um, you know, he had a lot of home runs. He put up a lot of big numbers. But it's also in the context of, uh, of the other players that played during his era. So we'll see how they feel about that. Um, other than Nellie Fox, what was the other question, Dick? Billy Pierce. Billy Pierce, um, fine pitcher, but uh, you know you got to remember one percent. Think about it. You know a lot of guys are in the top five percent. Not many guys are in the top one percent. That narrows pretty quickly when you get up to the top of that pyramid. So, so we'll see. There's an interesting political question that points out that Dick Cheney um, made 39 million dollars last year before he became vice president. I might make, <laughs> and that uh, A. Rod or Alexander Rodriguez makes $25 million a year. Which one do you think provided more joy or entertainment to Americans? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Vice President, <laughs> it's interesting the A-Rod story comes up because I was in St. Louis speaking a couple of months ago and I remembered a Sports Illustrated cover from my youth. You probably remember this, 1968. It was a Cardinals all lined up at their lockers, and there were four future Hall of Famers in that lineup. Amazing team. Cepeda was in there, and uh, Bob Gibson, and uh, Red Shane Deanst as the manager, and Lou Brock. And the title of that cover was The Highest Paid Team in Baseball History. This is 1968. What do you think the highest paid team in baseball history in 1968 made as a team? $607,000. Alex Rodriguez will make $607,000 in three and a half games. And he'll do that for every three and a half games for the next 10 years, okay? 
The Red Sox are now the highest paid team in baseball history with a payroll of $111 million. So. Uh, do you think that the, the Cleveland Indians should get rid of their Wahoo lo logo? And just what do you think in general about the Indian nicknames for uh, baseball teams? Mm, that's a little out of my league, I think. Um, you know, I think that's a decision for other people to decide on. You know, the, lo the local communities are, should probably make those decisions. You can call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> hey. A recent Gallup poll showed football as the number one sport in America with 63% and baseball second at 56%. And baseball fans tend to be older than those who favor football. Uh, do these numbers kind of trouble you? You know, when I was in New York Monday night for the premiere of that Billy Crystal movie, and you realize that when Roger Maris was going after Ruth's record on the last day of the season, there were 23,000 people in the stands. Most of Yankee Stadium was empty. When McGuire passed Maris, all of America was tuned in to Mark McGuire. The stadiums were filled every night. Um, uh, people are tuned into baseball. You know, there's, I love to, to hear from people who think that the glory period of baseball was the 1950s, and it was a pretty spectacular period, if you're a New York fan. Giants, Dodgers, and Yankees, okay? <laughs> but you think about what was Major League Baseball in those days. It was in the top quarter of the country. It was from Chicago to St. Louis to Washington to Boston. Those are the people that saw Major League Baseball. Three quarters of the country was shut out from Major League Baseball up until 1958. And so I think baseball is strong. There's 70 million people that attend Major League games today. 30 million attend minor league games. Those are big numbers. It's on television every night all through the country. So I think baseball's still got a great following. But I think we need to, to be vigilant about the state of the game. Youth programs, the Little League, um, and, uh, and making sure that the game is passed from generation to generation. And I think that's the role of the Hall of Fame. And uh, I think Major League Baseball is doing a pretty good job at that too right now. Isn't there a real problem in Major League Baseball with the financial differences between the teams that allow one team to be so much better than others? I think so. And, um, and I think the commissioner is trying to address that. And I think he's on the right track. Because until, until you have a team that starts in spring training and has a legitimate chance of winning, um, it's not very fair. And it's not very exciting for, t for people in those cities. Uh, who start the year knowing they're not going to have a pennant winner that year. Uh, so I think we need to get to some kind of parity, and I think the commissioner uh, wants to as quickly as he can, and uh, I think he's on the right track. Uh, can baseball, in your mind, uh, survive another strike, and do you think one can be avoided? I sure hope so. Um, um, you know, the American people have shown a lot of patience for this game through the years, and it has... Uh, it has survived and it has thrived. Um, but I hope that we don't have to go through a strike this year. I don't think it would be very healthy for the game. And um, I also think that, uh, but I do think there's a great reservoir of goodwill for the game. And it goes back to memories. And it goes back to youth for most of us. But the question is, what will be the memories of today's youth when they're our age? Will they remember baseball strikes and people and, uh, and things like that as opposed to the game on the field. And I think that's the great danger, maybe not, not to the game today, but the game in the future as those memories become uh, less romantic because of some of these things. I think there's a certain edge to this question. <laughs> it starts off, it says, uh, one, interleague play, two, the designated hitter, three, wild card entries in the playoffs. What can defenders of Major League Baseball do to prevent further such atrocities? <laughs> Was that from Adam or Eve? <laughs> uh, um, I'm a traditionalist, too. And I will uh, tell you that I don't like the designated hitter very much. Uh, but the game moves on. And I think some of the things that early on 
were not very popular or people thought took away the purity of the game have proven to be okay. I think interleague plays pretty good. I think it's kind of fun to see the Mets play the Yankees in the middle of the season or the Cubs play the White Sox or, uh, you know, um, in my hometown of Detroit, I like the Cardinals coming in and our fans getting a chance to see Mark McGuire. So I think, I think there are some things that initially are, uh, are uh, not very well accepted, but uh, when people see them work, they, they work okay. I still don't like the uh, designated hitter. Neither do I. Um, <coughs> this is a question that has some local interest, and Senator Bunning may be interested in as well. Will Washington ever get back a Major League Baseball team? I hope so. You know, there's a great tradition of baseball here. Uh, it goes way back to the early part of the century. And um, when we lived here all those years, uh, it was frustrating not having a team here. You, w you know, a major city like Washington, a world capital, uh, the world capital, uh, deserves to have a team. It's America's game. This is the focal point of the American political system. And um, I sure hope someday that um, things can be worked out so that there's a major league team in Washington. It's a major market with uh, much more diverse economy than there were, than, than there was in 1970 when the when the uh, senators left, so. As I mentioned earlier, Rocky Colavito was your favorite ball player when you were uh, confirmed in the church. Um, does he remain your favorite ball player? Mm, <laughs> wow. <well. laughs> when I was a kid, you know, I, I, I was like a lot of kids who thought they knew more about the game than their colleagues, and there are a lot of there were there are a lot of us. And um, Al Kaline, who Jim played with. Uh, uh, and Rocky played with, was one of those guys who had 25 home runs every year, 100 RBIs every year, and hit 310 every year. And so I thought that was kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> so I would pick, you know, Bill Freehan one year, Rocky Calavito another, just to be a little different from all the other kids who, who loved Rocky Calav or uh, loved Al Kaline because Al Kaline was the guy to love. And so Rocky Calavito was my hero. But I'll tell you who um, I've come to appreciate, Al Kaline, now uh, since I've gotten to know him better. What a fine human being. But also, uh, my favorite recent Tiger is Alan Trammell. And uh, my two favorite players today are Yvonne Rodriguez, the catcher for the Texas Rangers, fantastic player, and Omar Vizquel, the shortstop for the Cleveland Indians. Uh, I think Rodriguez is finally getting his due, but I don't think this Cal will ever get his due because he's playing in the shadow of Rodri uh, Alex Rodriguez and Derek Jeter and Nomar Garcia Pera. But to watch that guy play is like watching an acrobat play. He is just a beautiful player. Of the 30,000 items that are in the Hall of Fame, what do you consider the strangest or most unusual? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I Maybe not the strangest, but, but one of the most interesting is a bracelet that Lou Gehrig made for his wife. He took all of his championship rings and all of the jewelry uh, that he got through his career for various awards, and he strung them together and made a beautiful bracelet for Eleanor. And, uh, and that's a real conversation piece in the hall, too. That's, that's not one of the strangest, but it's, uh, it's a piece that many people don't know about. Um. <coughs> I think I read an article not long ago that said 25% of the Major League Baseball players today are now foreign-born. Do you see that this trend continuing? You know, you go down to Puerto Rico and you go down to the Dominican Republic and you see the passion for the game. And, uh, and those youngsters just play it day and night. Um, and it's like it used to be in America. Uh, and then America um, had a lot more... Um, there were a lot more opportunities for children to do other things. And so many of them have chosen to go a different route. Baseball is a difficult game to play. It takes a lot of practice. And it takes a lot of work to be good at it. Uh, and I think that the difference between Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and the U.S. are that those youngsters don't have quite as many opportunities as we have to get involved in other kinds of things. Baseball is it. It's the game. It's the game they're passionate about. And the Japanese, uh, if you go over to Japan, we were there last year for the opening of the season, the Cubs and Mets. And in every TV in Japan was the high school uh, s championships of Japan. It would be like the Final Four in basketball here where everybody's watching them. You go into every newsroom, 
every restaurant. They're watching the high school championships in Japan. And I love to see what Ichiro Suzuki is doing for the Seattle Mariners now. He is proving that they can play baseball in Japan. When we were there, we saw the Tokyo Giants play the, the Mets uh, in two exhibition games. And there was a right fielder for uh, Tokyo named Takahashi. He stood about six foot four, 235 pounds, and he hit a home run that day that I didn't think ever was going to come down. And he hit about 40, 46, 47 home runs the year before for the Tokyo Giants. So the Japanese players can really play, and I would expect to see more Japanese players in the major leagues in the, in the near future. Before I ask you the last question, Dale, I would like to present you with a couple of things. One is a certificate of appreciation for your appearance here today at the National yes, Press Club. Today. And secondly is a uh, National Press Club coffee mug, which can be used for any number of things. <laughs> well, thank you. The, um, the, the last question is, um, some people notice that you carry a Ty Cobb card <laughs> with you. Does this mean that you think Ty Cobb, a Detroit Tiger, was the best baseball player of all time? And lastly, someone wants to know, how much is that baseball card worth? <laughs> When I was leaving the National Geographic, where I had worked for almost 12 years and loved very much, very proud of my time there, um, I had a little baseball breakfast for my baseball friends from every different area of the Geographic. And we got together, and Sam Abel, one of the great photographers in the world, National Geographic photographer, uh, gave me a gift which I treasure. And the gift is a T-206-1909 tobacco card of Ty Cobb, because Sam knew I was a great Tiger fan. And um, I carry it in my business card case. And the day that I was formally elected by the board president of the Hall of Fame, Bowie Kuhn, who's got a great deep voice, said, Dale, now just remember, the Detroit Tigers are not the only team anymore. <laughs> and I said, I understand that, Mr. Kuhn. He didn't realize that Ty Cobb was in my pocket. <laughs> And I've never told him until now. So, <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dale, for, for a great appearance here today. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. And I'd like to thank uh, National Press Club staff members, Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie abdel Dermot, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's luncheon. And also thanks to the NPC Library for their research. And with my new gavel, I will say, we are adjourned. Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am a senior Washington correspondent for the Detroit News and president of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN, are listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888 343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of future speakers. On Friday, April 27th, Angela Perez Baracchio, Miss America, will be our guest. On Wednesday, May 2nd, Donna Brazil, former campaign manager for Al Gore, will be here to discuss election reform. How do we make it better next time? And on Thursday, March 3rd, uh, World Press Freedom Day, Vladimir Gazinsky, head of NTV in Russia, will be here to, at the press club to talk about press freedom in Russia. And on Friday, May 4th, Richard Moe, president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, will be affirmed in the Catholic Church. He chose St. Rocco as his patron saint. <laughs> and if you need to ask, Rocco was the name of Dale's all-time baseball hero. Rocky Colavito, a home run hitting outfielder for the Detroit Tigers and Cleveland Indians. Dale ushered at Tiger Stadium, wiping off seats for paying patrons, 
just so he could watch his heroes take batting and fielding practice. As a teenager, he played on two national championship teams and went on to play two years with the Central Michigan University Chippewas. But his dream of a pro career ended when he discovered, like so many others, that sharp breaking curveballs are not so easy to hit. <laughs> <laughs> he transferred to Michigan State University, where he graduated in 1978 with a degree in journalism. But when he came to Washington, Dale's love for the game and the Detroit Tigers never dwindled. Dale and his brother Dennis and a friend, Bill McKay, founded the Mayo Smith Society in 1983. The society was named after former Detroit Tigers manager Mayo Smith, who managed the Tigers to their 1986 World Series victory. Oh, I'm sorry, 1968 World Series victory over the St. Louis Cardinals. Today, the society has more than 2,000 members. Dale, 45, now lives with his wife and three children in Cooperstown, New York, a, a town of 2,300 residents and, I believe, the greatest shrine in sports. But I have to tell you, that as a Hall of Fame president, Dale's loyalty to the Detroit Tigers has become suspect. <laughs> Last year, I was at a luncheon when Mike Waller, who is the publisher of the Baltimore Sun, calmly declared that Eddie Collins, the old second baseman for the Philadelphia Athletics and Chicago White Sox, was unquestionably the best second baseman ever to play baseball. I disagreed. Anyone who has ever grown up in Detroit knows, without doubt, that Charlie Gehringer was the best second baseman ever. There's no doubt about that. Mike Wall and I talked about it. We sort of disagreed. But like so many baseball arguments, it was never settled. But I decided to call Dale, my old friend from Detroit, a down-to-the-soul, or so I thought, Detroit Tigers fan. He would take up Charlie's cause. I knew Mike Wall would respect a letter from the president of the Hall of Fame. <laughs> But, but when I asked Dale to write that letter, declaring Charlie the best, there was a long pause. <laughs> you know, Dick, he said, as president of the Hall of Fame, I have to remain neutral. I can't take sides. Well, I understand that, I told Dale, but, but we're talking about sweet-fielding Charlie Gehringer here. <laughs> this is the man who had 300 or better 13 times in his career. This is the Detroit Tigers. There was another long pause. Well, Dick, Dale said, Eddie Collins was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the letter was never written. So I've asked Dale to come to the National Press Club today to settle this argument. <laughs> Who was better, Eddie Collins or Charlie Gehringer, our guest? If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your tables and pass them up to me. But please write legibly so I can read the questions. And I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced and, and uh, are, have been able to stand up. From your right and my left, we have Larry Arnold, Washington reporter for the Associated Press. Gene Grabowski, a former Associated Press in Capitol Hill who covered our speaker and also a member of our speakers committee. Aaron Epstein, reti retired from Knight Ritter Newspapers and now a writing coach for the Journal Newspapers. Arthur Bernstein, president of the United Sports Fans of America and a member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Larry Speaks, a former press secretary for President Reagan. Gilbert Grobner, chairman of the board, National Geographic. Senator Jim Bunning, Republican from Kentucky and a pitcher for the Detroit Tigers and Philadelphia Phillies who is now a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Frank Ockerfer, the National Press Club Speakers Committee Chairman and a former NPC President. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, David Hess, the National Journal and a former National Press Club President and the Speakers Committee member who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, David. Angela Greiling of Small Newspapers. Greg Gilbert, Bureau Chief, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Larry Margasak, investigative reporter, Associated Press. George Condon, bureau chief, Copley Newspapers. Tom Deemer, reporter, Cleveland Plain Dealer. And Al Isley, editor of The Hill and a pitcher in the Cleveland Indians farm system for three and a half years. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> the 
Introducing our guest speaker today, Dale Petrosky, president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, is truly a pleasant assignment for me. Not only do I get to introduce someone who has arguably the best job in America, but I get to introduce a very good friend. Dale and I have been friends since he arrived in Washington 20 years ago as the press secretary for a congressman from Western Michigan. While that congressman quickly departed the political scene, Dale went on to become an assistant White House press secretary in the Reagan administration and chief spokesman for Elizabeth Dole when she was secretary of transportation. He then spent 11 years as a top executive with the National Geographic Society in Washington. But his true passion has always been baseball. When he was named Hall of Fame president in June of 1999, Dale said, and I quote, I was born with baseball in my blood. My dad made sure of that. My passion for the game is at the very core of who I am. As a kid growing up in the suburbs of Detroit, Dale dreamed of playing second base for his beloved Detroit Tigers. His romance for the game was so passionate that when he was